allow me to introduce Jean Gurkoff, Dr. Jean Gurkoff, uh, who's one of our star postdoc researchers at CBST. Um, are you going to bring your own students? They couldn't come for one reason or other. I was going to bring a couple. Losers. Okay, so anyways, uh, Gene's been terrific. He's, uh, he's working in a, in a special application area of neuroscience. We actually don't have that many people um, developing biophotonic applications in this area. And so because of this, uh, we asked uh, Gene to come over to talk about his, his area, which is in traumatic brain injury. All right, and now we can use biophotonics there. So okay. with that, thank you very yeah. much for coming over. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about neuroscience in general, because I think the, uh, the marriage of photonics and neuroscience or neurophotonics is actually kind of important. So who am I? Um, like I was saying earlier, I graduated from Brown in 98. Um, I worked with a guy named uh, Michael Walker, and what he had is a pain lab and we were doing electrophysiology and, and drug therapy for a chronic pain model. So I started out doing some pretty high-level electrophysiology and rodents. And then I went to another neuroscience lab at UCSF for two years before graduate school, where I was also in a chronic pain lab doing mostly behavior and pharmacology. Um, I went down to UCLA and worked in the Brain Injury Research Center for about six years to get my PhD. So that's traumatic brain injury, so I switched gears. And again, mostly behavior, a little bit of anatomy, a little bit of drugs. And then I started this postdoc at UC Davis in 2007. Again, staying in neuroscience, but now adding CBST as part of my, uh, my experience. So what's, what's important here is 100% of my research up through my PhD was animals, on TBI or chronic pain, all of the research was in animals in the sense of behavior and pharmacology and surgery and electrophysiology. And I knew what fluorescence microscopy was. And that was about the limit up until I started at Davis. Um, so why was I interested in this program? And um, a lot of the questions we get when we go out there and talk about our TBI research is, well, what's the mechanism? Why are these things happening? What's happening at the cellular level? And I really just didn't have the techniques to address those questions. And so I thought, you know, if I can come and learn how to use photonics, I can start to look at an individual cell level, maybe individual parts. I can understand the mechanism of injury a little bit better, which will help feedback onto all this stuff. Um, so you guys familiar with neuroscience at all? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, okay. So um, it's just the nervous system. Um, one of the things I really like about neuroscience is how it it's all of these fields, right? You can basically be interested in any biological, biochemical, engineering field and somehow tie it to neuroscience almost. And I, I always find that very interesting because I get to interact with all of these people. So it's not just in a room talking with people who do the same stuff all the time for 30 years, potentially. Um, and what's interesting about neurotrauma research, which is uh, very neuroscience-based, is that there's uh, evidence of trepanation as early as 8,500 8, BC. So people have been doing head surgeries for this long. And uh, manuscripts dating back to 5,000 5, BC uh, indicated that Egyptians had some knowledge about brain trauma. So this is a very, very old problem. Um, and neuroscience is a very, very old field, even though we've just started studying it recently. Um, two of my favorite studies, which are biomedical engineering based, are one is this remote control rat. Have either of you guys heard of that? So, okay, there's a building, there's an earthquake, the building collapses, there's tons of rubble. Right now what they do is they use dogs. They send dogs to the rubble to try to sniff and find humans. Problem is dogs are pretty big. Rats are a lot smaller, but you can't really train a rat to go through cracks and look for people. However, you can make a remote control rat. So what they've got here is a little backpack, and it's got some stimulators going into the brain, and they can drive this rat around these obstacles, up a ladder, down the stairs, around and around, um, and the way they did this was they had uh, stimulating electrodes in the median forebrain bundle. So it's basically they're giving a positive reinforcement. And then they have electrodes in the right and left somatosensory whisker representations. So what they can do is give a, a movement on the joystick that has some stimulation with the whisker. And if the rat moves in the right direction, it gets a stimulus, which is a reward stimulus, and the rat likes it, so it does it. And they can basically program these rats you can guide them from 500 meters away. They have a little camera on top, and they can go through rubble. So I thought that was a really neat experiment, and it is a marriage of uh, engineering and uh, neuroscience. 
One of the other very cool ones I, I actually interviewed with one of the guys doing this study at, at Duke years and years and years ago is this idea that you have a spinal injury and you can't control your arms and legs anymore. I don't know if you've heard of this one already. Yeah, they have it. Like, they actually might be the people who have a special one. Like, it's possible. He's Nicol Aylis is one of the guys, and then John Donahue is another guy. Yeah, he's a, but my boyfriend is completely into this, though. So. Okay. He doesn't do research on it, but we used to work in our own Okay. Really so the basic okay. So the basic premise, though, is that if you're an adult and you have a spinal lesion and you can't control your arms and legs, your brain is still intact, right? All of the circuitry that activates the motion is intact. Everything below and above the injury are intact. It's just that circuit is broken. So what they said is, well, can we train the brain to move a mechanical arm? So the basic experiment what they did is they took a primate and they put a multi multi electrode unit in the head and they had it touch dots on a screen and move its arm. And they generate they generate an algorithm based on how the, the arm movement was. And then what they did is they basically used that algorithm and programmed this mechanical arm, which was actually in another room. And then they'd have the animal do the experiment again and they'd fine tune the arm in the other room. Then what they did is they taped the animal's arm or cast the animal's arm down and had it think taught it to think about it. And of course, it's getting a reward whenever it does the right thing. And the animal eventually learned to use its brain to control the mechanical arm. But how did the that make the animal think to do exactly that? It's food deprived. Uh -huh. And um, I don't remember how exactly they did it, but they get an orange juice reward. And they know the task. They've done the task over and over and over again. I don't know if they were able to see the arm or how it went, but they were able to convince the animal to do this. And I mean, the... the the idea, and they've got some of this really basic stuff, the equipment's really large right now, is that you know eventually you can replace an arm and have it be totally functional with the brain controlling it. So I, I always thought those are really neat and something that wouldn't happen if engineering and neuroscience hadn't intersected. Um, so also this is one of my big points about this. One of the major dri drivers of science is technology, right? And I'm going to go into Parkinson's disease in this in a minute. Um, it, it provides neuroscientists, and you, I don't consider myself an end user at CBST, it provides us with new uh, tools for analysis and manipulation of the nervous system. And um, with biophotonics in particular, you know, the last two slides I showed are very systems-based, but what I'm still trying to do is understand the problem we're trying to fix. And biophotonics in particular will allow us to look at some of the smaller changes and hopefully, hopefully allow us to identify some of the problems or to really see where our therapies are working. Um, so again, I said neuroscience is a pretty old, uh, pretty old study, and these are some of the diseases that we hear about a lot. Parkinson's disease was found in 1817, Alzheimer's was characterized in 1901, Huntington's 1872. So these diseases have been around for a while, and, and I do consider traumatic brain injury a disease of the nervous system. It's just uh, you get one instead of catching uh, having a genetic problem or you know um, toxins. So uh, time and technology, remember this was kind of what I was talking about before. So Parkinson's disease was discovered in 1817. So this is just medicine. Somebody noticed a bunch of patients had very similar symptoms and realized uh, maybe, I think they probably did autopsies, that they had the same lesion. It was not until 1950 when biochemistry was really coming online that they came up with the first treatment, which was L-DOPA. They put in a precursor for a drug that the brain could no longer produce itself, and the patients were able to get some recovery. Uh, in 1982, there was this really famous MPTP experiment. It was an experiment, disaster maybe in San Jose. Have you guys heard of this? There was a bad heroin, and what happened is when they were making the heroin, there was the chemical reaction went wrong and they made this compound MPTP. And when the patient when the people took the drug, it destroyed their substantia nigra, which is the region that um, Parkinson's destroys. So there was a bunch of twenty and thirty year olds who had zero cells left. And usually with Parkinson's you get you, you start to get the disorder with about seventy percent of the cell death later in life. And so they had these patients that had absolute lesions what was nice about them is there was no genetic component. There was nothing in the system, right? It was a drug. It went in and went out. So if you put in new cells, they wouldn't get damaged. But they implanted field stem cells and had some recovery. So but again, this took genetics and stem cell science, which wasn't available prior to this time point. Um, in 2002, deep brain stimulation was approved for Parkinson's patients who were really far along. So this is where they just put an electrode down and generate a theta rhythm, and they get some recovery. So again, new technology, new treatment. 
And then I have down here uh, neurophotonics from DIC to GFP. So again, going small, um, my wife actually works in a Parkinson's Huntington's lab with GFP mice. And what I'm going to show you is some images. And the first is uh, DIC. Do you guys know DIC? Okay, so I'll skip this. And fluorescence imaging also, you know, very simple, just the arc lamp and the sample. And uh, you guys know green, green fluorescent protein, right? And you know that he won the Nobel Prize this year for this, so I can blow through that. Um, so this is what they used to look at in the lab exclusively. So this is just the DIC image. In this case, it's a wild, pel wild type cell. So what they did is they took the striatum out of the mouse and they pipetted it up and down to dissociate the cells. And then they were doing electrophysiology on these cells. So this came from a wild type animal and this came from a knockout animal. You know that because you did the, the, uh, the DNA analysis. So you know what they're expression, expressing. And this is for a specific NMDA receptor. Sorry, but, the e, the e, the e. Um, I forget, but it's the, it uh, doesn't bleach as much. I forget which one it is. Um, and, uh, but what they really wanted to know is the interaction between dopamine receptors and NMDA receptors. So there's two dopamine receptors that are expressed in these cells, D1 and D2. From this kind of image, you'd never be able to tell. And you can't do genetics on an individual cell, so you're kind of stuck. So what they would do is record from the cell and then give each of the drugs and see how it responded. And that meant you had to keep the cell alive longer, you had to give it additional treatments. But then somebody finally came up with the genetic model where they were able to put the GFP behind a promoter specific for either D1 or D2. So now you can go in and see this cell has the green fluorescent protein, and this is a D D1 mouse, and this is a D2 mouse. Why is everything green? It's just background. If I cleaned up the image, it would be better. <laughs> so, um, but she just emailed, my wife just emailed me these last night. So, but the... the before, they had to just kind of take a shot in the dark. She wanted to record D1 cells, so she'd just record a bunch of cells, and later on, she'd have to figure out if she was successful or not. So these kind of little changes that we can get from biophotonics can really help move our research on. Kind of makes sense, right? Okay. So I'm, now I'm not a Parkinson's guy. I'm a TBI guy. Um, and I'm just curious. If you had to rank these, um, which do you think has the highest incidence in the country? Heart disease? How about second? Okay, third? <laughs> Come on. Okay. What, 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 do you think is, what do you think is last? So, number one is heart disease with over 1.5 million deaths, just deaths alone. Number two is actually traumatic brain injury, where there's 1.5 million incidences a year. A lot of these are mild and moderate, not the really severe type, but there's 1.5 million. Breast cancer is next, around 250,000, right? So that's um, one-sixth of traumatic brain injury. Parkinson's is about 60,000 per year, right? Um, autism is about 560,000 children total, right? And uh, HIV AIDS is 56,000 a year, so similar to Parkinson's. And Huntington's is almost, it's almost nothing. Um, up until about three years ago, um, traumatic brain injury, as far as funding went, was probably at the bottom. And the reason is, I think, twofold. One is exposure. Um, heart disease, well, so many people have it. But breast cancer, there's a huge society. Women have gotten together and made a very big deal. They organize walks. They organize groups. Um, Parkinson's has had a couple famous people develop Parkinson's and become spokespeople. And the nice thing about the disease is you actually do have a window where you're fully, pretty much fully functional and you can get out on the road like Michael J. Fox has. Autism's just been in the news everywhere. But it wasn't until partway through the Iran, uh, Iraq war this time around that traumatic brain injury really started getting much attention. And all of a sudden now, um, there seems to be funding opportunities for us. So this is from the CDC, uh, about 50,000 deaths a year, over 235,000 hospitalizations. So there's more hospitalizations than there are detections of breast cancer, over a million emergency department visits. Um, so this is a really big issue. And uh, one thing I want to point out about heart disease is when you look at the percent of the population that has heart disease, um, I'm pretty low risk. Uh, my parents are medium risk. And as you get really old, you get into the high risk. Well, traumatic brain injury is the other way around for the most part. The highest area of risk is teenagers, right? And so what does this mean? It means if you get a severe injury in here, 
you have the rest of your life to live with this, right? Whereas Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, you're, you're getting those diseases out here. And so it's really end of, it's toward the end of your life. So we have this huge patient population. And uh, just to point out, um, over almost 500,000 children suffer TBI. It is the number one cause of death and disability in this age group, these age groups. Um, so what do you like to understand under traumatic brain injury? What exactly is so that Anything from a concussion, a concussion on a. So in this case, in this case, all of these people had to report it, uh-huh. right? So it means it was severe enough that they actually went to a hospital. So when I had my concussion, I actually did get a concussion. I didn't know it until I started doing TBI research. I'm like, really? That's what it is. I've had one of those. Um, I never went to the hospital. I blacked out. Um, anything from a concussion on up. A concussion is huh? So. A concussion is, um, I mean, people will argue exactly where a concussion begins. Uh, if you black out at all, lose consciousness even for half a second, I think I was out for three seconds, that's a concussion. But generally it's described as any traumatic brain injury where you're pretty much CT negative. So when you do a scan, there's no blood problems, there's no swelling problems, there's no blah, 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 blah. You've had a head injury, you're having some sort of effect, but when you do tests, you don't see anything. So that tends to be a concussion, although people will argue about where the borders and ends. Um, then there's diffuse wounds versus focal wounds. So like if you hit your head in a car accident, it's diffuse focal. Somebody takes it back to your head, and there's penetrating wounds like bullets and knives. Um, so these are all very different. Um, they're all missing in that. Huh? Children, number of children affected. Where? Four, seven, five. Oh, yeah, there's supposed to be a zero there. It's almost 500,000. <laughs> So, um, and, you know, in, in here it's mostly motor vehicle abuse, um, bicycle, sports, falls. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about is what's tricky about TBI. So Parkinson's is a very s- specific subset of neurons in the basal ganglia that die. So you have a target, right? And in Huntington's disease, you have this triplet repeat disorder, which causes a change in protein expression. So again, you have a target. Um, and go on, Alzheimer's, there's neuronal atrophy and plaque formation, so you have a target. Uh, in each case, we know there's a target, a characteristic pathology and behavioral outcome, so we know how what we're targeting for improvement. And um, actually, before I go to this, we actually had one of the leading neurosurgeons, I think, in the world from UCSF here just a couple weeks ago and talking about something that a lot of the young people in the traumatic brain injury field have been talking about, is we generally um, judge the severity of a concussion, based, or severity of a head injury, based on three scores. Uh, your ability to respond to commands, your ability for your eyes to move, and then there was another motor response, uh, and it's called the Glasgow Cone Scale, and it's from 3 to 15. So if you come in with a hematoma, like blood accruing, or you come in with a bullet wound, if you score the same, your injury is considered the same. It's considered as severe. And so part of the problem is, is a gunshot wound is in no way like a hematoma, which is in no way like diffuse swelling, which is in no way like another kind of injury. All our injuries are so very different. And one of the things we're trying to do in the field now is say, okay, well, let's start really picking, instead of calling them mild, moderate, severe, let's really start focusing on the individual injuries and trying to model them. Um, I have a further problem with it, which is I'm from the Department of Neurological Surgery. That's where TBI started about 30 years ago, where the research started. So it's surgeons that are interested in this. And what surgeons usually do is they get somebody that just got injured, they get them in, they try to save all their cells and as much tissue as possible, and then pass them off. So the typical thing is there's a traumatic brain injury. Some cells survive. Some cells die. Some cells tend to have abnormal formations, like they'll start firing when they're not supposed to fire, or the opposite, not firing when they're supposed to fire. Um, they can form connections with other cells they didn't have connections with. There's also probably some cells that are just kind of stuck out there doing nothing or just doing random things, not necessarily harming the system. Now, the neurosurgeon's general belief is you put on a drug or you do some sort of therapy, what you're going to do is you're going to save these cells and um, everybody's going to be happy. You talk to most, especially the senior neurosurgeons, this is what they all believe. I ask the question, why? Why, if you save the cells, are they going to do that? Why aren't they going to do this? So I think, especially when you're looking at biophotonics, you have to ask the question, what are the cells we saving looking like, and what, how are they behaving? And I think that's going to be critical. So, okay, getting into here again. 
Uh, no two TDIs are the same. Anatomical and behavioral consequences vary. We don't know any of the mechanisms. There's no definite target for therapy. Um, our current targets get onto that last slide. They don't guarantee that you're going to have a positive behavioral outcome. They can show in a lot of models that you save cells. But so far, out of 60 or so clinical trials, we have zero successes. No. So, um, and again, I think one of the, the key things, and I'm really surprised that neurosurgeons miss out on this, is it doesn't matter if we save cells. It matters if our, parent, our patient's quality of life gets better. And so those are the questions. That's the question we always have to um, remember. And I throw this in here because uh, this is me. This is Justin, who's going to come today. He's one of the graduate students in my lab. And this is Kim, who's one of our technicians up in Tahoe last year. I always wear a helmet all the time because it's just not worth the risk. Once you get a head trauma, you get a head trauma. And helmets might suck. Actually, for skiing, they're great. But like on bikes, they might suck. But it's absolutely, absolutely not worth the risk. Um, so, okay. Now we're going to get into my interest in trauma, which is this idea of uh, two injuries. So I played a lot of sports in high school. And, you know, you get banged around and you get banged around some more. And the question is always, well, when do you sit a player out? How long do they have to stay out? How long is their brain vulnerable? And everybody in the world thinks if you get a concussion and then 15 minutes later get another concussion, you're really bad shape. That's just, everybody believes that. So I thought um, this would be the easiest dissertation in the world. Nobody's done it yet. Everybody believes it. So what I did was, um, for modeling reasons, is I gave a traumatic brain injury or a sham And then either one, six, or 24 hours, I gave really bad seizures, chemically induced seizures to these animals. And then what I did is I looked 24 hours later for cell death. And the reason we looked 24 hours later, it's 24 hours after this injury, is that, that in both these injuries separately, that's kind of when the peak acute cell death was. And I used uh, paraffin embedding, and then I did some fluorescence cell counting. Um, so what I have here is sham alone caused no cell death. My traumatic brain injury, we choose to do a relatively mild one, doesn't cause any cell death. It does cause some behavioral deficits. Um, then here's seizures alone, and this is like per section. You see there's this amount of cell death. I said double injury, obviously you're going to have vulnerability. The animals can be a lot worse off. So this is double injury one hour later, six hours later, and 24 hours later. It's not up here, right? It's down here. It actually, there was in some groups statistical improvement. So there was less cell death. So I was kind of surprised. Um, it's statistically identical. I mean, it's like 0.7. Is 0.7. Yes, this number is, is absolutely like higher. The number is higher, but when you do the statistical, oh, this, these, these are compared to LFP, not compared to pyocarp. And I should actually switch this out. These are statistically different from this. These are not statistically different from this. The p value is like 0.7. It's not even close to significant. So here's, this is kind of the measure. This is, what we expected was this plus this would equal way up here. And this is no different from just having the seizures alone. Um, and these are actually better than if they'd had the seizures alone. So trauma seemed to protect the cells from seizures. Sorry, I wasn't clear about that. Um, but remember I said, nobody really cares about cell death, right? We care about outcome. So what's also interesting is neurosurgeons have patients for two to three weeks and they never see them again. In fact, I had a friend who just had a tumor removed. She caught her own tumor on an MRI. She, controlled, she was her own control subject and found a tumor. She went to the neurosurgeon three weeks later and she says, I'm done with you. You deal with this person now. So neurosurgeons really only try this period. And when you look at traumatic brain injury research in mice and rats, almost nobody studies the animals after two or three weeks. So I did. I went 20 weeks. And... Um, I didn't actually, I, I'm not going to show you the behavior, but at 20 weeks I did a seizure threshold test and I did some staining for uh, aberrant sprouting of cells uh, in the hippocampus and uh, cell counts. And I'm not going to show you all the data, but one thing that happened is just looking at um, epileptic animals, animals that had gen uh, random seizures. No control animals had seizures. No trauma alone animals that had seizures. Almost 75% of the double injured animals had seizures. So there was acute protection against cell death, but these animals still were showing seizure behavior. And it was, while it wasn't statistically more than seizure, guys that got chemical status alone, it looked like it was higher. Um, when I looked for sprouting, so what this is, is this is a region in the hippocampus, um, and usually what happens is, so you see this fiber here? This isn't supposed to be here. That's like one fiber. It's, would be a score of one, an occasional granular. And when you get these, these sprouts, it's highly uh, correlated with seizure. 
behavior. So this is what it looks like when there's a lot of sprouting. You can see all these sprouts out here and uh, a lot of these granules out here in the supergranular layer. And what we found was in the controls and trauma, there wasn't a lot of sprouting. Again, in the seizures alone or the double injured animals, there was sprouting. So I thought we'd see vulnerability. What we saw, at least acutely, was neuroprotection, so the cells didn't die. But when we look later on, the pilocarpine animals alone and the trauma plus pilocarpine animals were indistinguishable. So it looked like that acute neuroprotection didn't lead to any sort of long-term outcome. So why is this, uh, where do I go from here? Um, so there's two things. One is this uh, protective phenomenon. So we know in that acute period there seems to be a way to protect these cells. And maybe there's a way to kind of harness this and protect them longer, if we can figure out what's protecting them. Maybe that will prevent the long-term changes. Um, and the way I think that, that protection happens is this acute inactivation in the brain. So there's a lot of activity, and then the brain's quiescent. So if you try to stimulate it, nothing happens, or very little happens. And then the question becomes, if inactivation saves the cells, what are these cells doing? And is there a way maybe that we can manipulate these cells that, that we save so that they'll do what we want? So this would be my model. There's a typical physiological neuron activity. There's an action potential that comes down. Glutamate's released, binds receptors. Sodium and calcium come in. Potassium goes out, and you get another action potential. After trauma, you have a lot of action potentials. You have a lot of glutamate released. You have a lot of intracellular sodium and calcium buildup and the cell dies. And so that's the basic model for trauma or, or seizures. Okay, and the way we're gonna model this in vitro is this stretch injury. So we have a, these cells that are grown on a flexible membrane and we can deform the membrane and it actually produces a motion very similar to what you get in a concussion where there's a torsion on the cells. And by increasing the strain, um, we, we have a mild, moderate, and severe injury which has a, a grade of cell death that we can cause. So we have a, a way to scale it. And um, what we can show with this, this is sodium on the y-axis, and this is time on the x-axis, and the injury is going to be here at zero. We have a five-minute baseline. And as you increase the severity of injury, you increase the amount of intracellular sodium. So remember that pathological 10 action potential neuron, you have that big sodium in there. So we see that with this model. Um, and then what we have here, uh, I actually forget what this one is. This one's calcium down here. And again, we have time here. And if you do an injury, you get this increase in calcium. And it actually also is, I actually put the wrong one in there, that also is uh, severity dependent. So as you increase the severity of this flexation, you get that model of pathology that I, I kind of tried to show. So yeah, this one here, right? There's your big sodium and calcium. And like I said on the very first slide where I showed the model, that leads to cell death. So that's, that's kind of what we're working with. Um, do you guys know anything about apoptosis? Okay, program cell death, Yvonne. <laughs> okay, so what this is basically here is this is an astrocyte that's surrounding two neurons, pre- and postsynaptic, glutamate released. These are three different glutamate receptors. When you have too much activation, you have cell death. And the way that this works is you have this insult. Calcium goes up. Um, calcium is sucked up by the mitochondria. They're a great calcium sink. But what happens is eventually you get too much calcium built up, the charge gets all wrong, it reverses, the mitochondria basically bursts. So you kill all the mitochondria, or many of them. They release these cytochromes, which act as caspases, which act with these other proton, proteins, which kills the cell both by apoptosis and necrosis. Um, you can also get reactive oxygen species, which activate some of these same pathways. Um, so there's a lot of ways cells can die. So what most of the neurosurgeons have done is they've kind of picked their favorite target. What's their favorite protein? So we have a lot of collaborators who are working on saving these things. So my question is, if you burst 80% of the mitochondria but then save the cell, because actually what they, they target is these guys down here. So if you burst all those mitochondria and save the cell, what's that cell going to be doing? It can't make ATP anymore, right? If you block here at the calpane level, you have all this calcium activation which I didn't talk about neuroplasticity, but calcium is how you activate neuroplasticity. So what's that cell going to look like? What proteins are going to be transcribed when you have all this calcium buildup? You just stop this step. So I think a good place to try to look at is here. And uh, one of the things that they learned about, one of the first things they learned about traumatic brain injury, and I think one of the reasons it wasn't studied for so many years is the idea was you hit the wall in a car accident, 
okay, that's it. How do you how do you protect against that? But what they found is a lot of those cells don't die at the time of injury. They actually die over weeks, weeks to months. So it means those cells aren't dying right away, which means you can actually target some of those uh, necrotic and apoptotic me mechanisms there. So remember, I, I showed this uh, neuroprotection from the trauma, right? So that's what I was essentially doing, right? The neuroprotection, I think, was blocking this initiating insult. And so you guys all know the, you know the action potential? Okay. So sodium comes in, potassium goes out, you have this hyperpolarization. I don't know if you remember this. If you block this potassium going out, then the cell won't repolarize. The sodium channels will stay inactivated, and you can't fire that neuron again. Okay? So that's a pretty basic concept. After trauma, this is... Um, this has been done in human and rat. This is a rat study from my old lab. They did a, a, a I'm a blanking on the name, so I have it up here. They did microdialysis and looked at extracellular potassium following injury. So um, in a sham, on a very mild injury, there was no accumulation of extracellular potassium. When the injury gets severe enough, a lot of potassium builds up outside the cell. And that's also been shown in humans. So going back to here, the idea would be, if there's a lot of potassium outside, you get rid of that concentration gradient. So if there's no concentration gradient for potassium moving out of a cell, then you block this repolarization and you block the reactivation of the sodium channels. So what I actually think is happening is you put on the convulsant and the animals just aren't convulsing as much because the cells are not activated enough. So how am I going to model this in vitro? So I have um, a cell death study and a calcium recording study. So I have these modified ringers where I just um, increase the concentration of potassium. I have to balance the ringers so that I, uh, the, it's the right osmolarity because otherwise you just burst them. If I just keep putting potassium in the cells, will all burst. Um, and then I do, so I do modified ringers for 10 minutes, then I injure these guys, and then I quantify cell death. Or I load these cells with FURA. Uh, this should be 30 minutes. I put in the modified ringers, I do a moderate stretch or severe injury, and then I record calcium changes. And so the first thing I did, and the red doesn't show up very well, was just um, basic immunocytochemistry. So this is carboxyfluorescein, which actually just gets absorbed by cells. And here you can see this one cell here with these bright dots. So propidium iodide won't get taken up unless there's some breakdown of the membrane. So the only way propidium iodide gets into the nucleus is if the nuclear membrane is breaking down, which means that cell is dying. So what we basically did was count living cells and dying cells. And we saw that as you increase the concentration of extracellular potassium, you decrease the amount of cell death. So it looked like... If you increase it? Increase the extracellular concentration of potassium. What you do is you basically make the reversal potential decrease for potassium. So, or you get rid of the concentration gradient, I'm sorry. So now potassium won't flow out of the cell, and theoretically the sodium channels won't be reactivated. So as we increase potassium to a point, we get a significant decrease in cell death. So that seemed to support my hypothesis. And then, do you guys know ratio metric? How long period do you observe the cell? It's 24 hours. 24 hours. 24 hours. Still alive. Many of them are still alive after that time. Some of them die. I mean, that's what we're looking at is we're comparing living cells to dying cells. Uh, I should have gone over the y-axis is percent cell death. So I take the total number of living and dying cells and then divide by, I don't remember if I divide by living or dying, but basically if we call this a maximum cell death, there's a reduction in cell death. It's not 100% of cells dying, it's just maximal cell death. Because not so a diagram look like for cells, you are not, where you're not increasing testing. Oh, that's this one here, normal ringers, I'm sorry. Oh, that's the normal. normal ringers, yeah. So that's 100% cell death. And so no injury wouldn't be zero, but it would be down yeah. there. Even with no injury, so they're in culture, so they just die. So do you guys know ratio metric dyes? Okay. So what we do is calcium imaging with this dye fura too. So it's a dual excitation or ratio metric dye. So you can excite it at 380, and that excites when there's unbound calcium, and 340, so it's bound calcium. You can actually excite it anywhere between 300 and 400, but you get these two specific peaks here. Uh, 380, actually it's, it's not, yeah, it's 370 is actually the peak. We recorded at 380 and then 340 for the bound. Um, regardless of where you stimulate or excite, the emission is always at 510. And so basically what we do is we take a ratio of the bound, 340, to the unbound, 
um, to measure the changes in the calcium concentration. So as calcium comes in, the dye binds it, and when the dye binds it, um, that's when you get the, uh, the peak at 340. So the advantages of a ratio metric is you don't have to worry about loading concentration because it's a ratio. You don't have to worry about photo bleaching because it's a ratio. You don't have to worry about leakage because it's a ratio, right? If there's more or less of the dye in the cell, it doesn't affect the ratio. And so that's why these dyes are so advantageous. You don't have to worry about any of the corrections. The disadvantages, especially with Fura, Fura is actually a really old dye. I think we use it just because it's so simple. Is this one actually bleaches a lot? And so I'm interested in how cells change over a period of hours, maybe days. Fura is not a great dye to do that. Um, it will photo bleach. The other thing, and this is more technical neuroscience, is it's a high affinity calcium binder. So you know what high affinity means, right? It means it binds it and doesn't let go. So in physiological neuroscience, when calcium comes into a cell, it's bound up like this, right? So you get, if you look with the right dye, you see this really sharp peak in calcium and it comes right down. The problem when you use a high affinity dye is the calcium comes in, the dye binds it, the dye doesn't let go. So you get this big peak, and it's probably not true because in most cases it would be bound. I might argue that in pathophysiology, that's not the case, but uh, that's one of the disadvantages of this dye. So again, here's, here's what it would look like. Um, this is between 300 and 400. At 370, there's this peak for when the calcium is unbound. At 340, there's this peak for when it's bound. And so this would be a mock experiment. So you're just kind of humming along. There's a ratio here. You put on an agonist. The bound calcium goes up. The, when you stimulate 340, the 510 goes up. You stimulate 380, the 510 goes down. So the ratio goes up. Um, as the agonist gets broken down, it comes back down to baseline. If you put on an ionophore for calcium, again, it goes up. When you bind the calcium, it comes back down. So you get these ratios. And it's really simple to use. Um, and I'll show you a video of it in a little bit. But for my preliminary data here, remember I said I did the same potassium study. So when you, this is a ratio. So um, buffer alone. So when you put on one of these potassium buffers, what you can see, this is the normal ranger, so I should be consistent with that. Sorry about that. You know, I normalize it to one. So when you add any of the potassium buffers alone, actually that triggers some calcium signal, which is not entirely surprising. Putting potassium onto cells will actually activate them to some degree. So here's my normal ringers. I did a moderate injury, and you can see that the ratio goes up six times. And for a severe injury, actually it was similar. Went up about the same amount. In the presence of these potassium buffers, the ratio didn't go up. So it looked like I actually was reducing calcium entry into those cells, which is pretty cool. Um, so the summary would be, looks like increasing potassium reduces cell death, and it reduces sodium and calcium buildup in the cell. So and are the cells actually still functioning normal, or what is, I mean... I'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> well, that's, that's the right question to ask, but not the question that most people ask. So... Um, Again, I was interested in double injury. So what I did here was I, I, I loaded Fura. I did a mild or severe injury. And the reason I did a mild and severe is if you go back to that old slide from potassium from microdialysis in my lab, mild injury caused no potassium buildup. Severe injury caused a lot of potassium buildup extracellularly. So the hypothesis would be that this one would be protective and this one wouldn't. Um, I wait 60 minutes and then I do another severe injury and then I record for 15 minutes. And I'm, uh, so I'm recording the calcium change in that whole period there. And so here's a movie from a severe, normal ringers, and then 60 minutes later, severe. And it's hard. It doesn't show up great. Is there another way to turn it? Okay. So it comes out a little better on the screen always. These are less green, a little bit more red. And then you'll see there's a couple times where I'm just moving it. But you'll know very quickly when I actually do the injury. I'll see if they just jump the green. And then I'll do a second injury. And look at this cell here and this cell here. There was a second injury. They're just dying. When the membrane goes, all the dye disappears. So one thing you saw is those cells got very green, so the calcium went way up. And after the second injury, two, two or three of those cells died. So that's what you predict, a severe injury, no change in potassium, then a severe injury. Well, what happens if I do change the potassium, which is what I think would happen in, um, <clears throat> in the case of a real injury, based on that microdialysis? So they're red and green. They go a little bit green. Then you're waiting, you're waiting. There's a the second injury. So the calcium didn't really go up, and the cells certainly didn't die. So it looked like 
the potassium right after that first injury actually did reduce activity. So again, this kind of supports the idea that extracellular potassium will reduce calcium accumulation and potentially reduce cell death. Do you say the pop of membrane? What do you mean pop of membrane? So that, that one where it's after the secondary, after the second injury, mm -hmm. suddenly they go in, you had a couple of cells go from bright to dark. They die. Well, what does it mean die in terms of the fluorescence? The membrane just deteriorated and there's nothing to hold the dye in. It diffuses away. Right. I mean, the buffer is an excess. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Those membranes popped. Um, but you notice they didn't pop right away on the injury. They popped after the injury. So, yeah, the, the cells died. The membrane started to disintegrate. And there's an excess of buffer. So, uh, so that is one of, the, one of the interesting things about this model. You know, I'm putting on these very specific potassium buffers. In vivo, the extracellular space is almost nothing. So you can actually just get the potassium change from the injury. In vitro, these things are sitting in one mil of solution. So any potassium change just gets washed away. So we have that excess, which is why I have to do it this way. So in summary, increasing the potassium reduced intracellular calcium buildup following either single or double injury seems to reduce cell death. And then the question becomes, is this a good thing? Do we really want to be saving those cells? Or is it better just to let them die? And um, we'll get back to this one. And actually, my newest analogy, I do have a new analogy for this, is, again, the war in Iraq, the armor is so improved. So compared to previous wars, we're having a lot more soldiers return from the war who've been involved in some major explosions in combat. Some of those soldiers are in really good shape. And it's like, thank God we have that armor, they're in really good shape. Some of these soldiers are coming back with loss of many limbs, severe head trauma. They're never going to have a quality of life again. I mean, these are really, really messed up people. And so... Improve, like this therapy, putting on these, this body armor, some of the cells are saved, some of the cells and, and are fine, and some of the cells are saved and are really messed up. And the question is, how do we start identifying that? So this kind of goes to addressing one of your questions. So I injured the cells um, either 1, 6, 24, or 72 hours prior to calcium imaging. Loaded them with Fira 2, um, then uh, put them in a loading buffer, gave a five-minute baseline, and then I gave what in this model is a signaling concentration of glutamate. So this is not a toxic concentration. This is enough to have a normal buildup of calcium. The cells all survive. Um, it's not necessarily physiological, but it's, it's kind of close. And it's what has been modeled in this, in this kind of injury before. And then I record again. And the theory would be is if the cells are really poorly manipulated, or, or you know something really bad happens, so the mitochondria are all dead, or there's no more synaptic connections, or the receptors are all internalized, that the response to this glutamate will change. Now these studies I really just started doing a couple weeks ago, so I don't have a ton of data, but this here is a control that I injured, um, and then uh, this is a control with calcium injury, and then this one will be a moderate stretch injury. And so this is again 72 hours following the what would be the injury. And uh, oh, I guess I should have. And what you'll see is the cells go very green when they're activated. There's no injury. That kind of makes sense. Um, on this side, what you'll see is it's kind of red with little green. And after the injury, nothing really happens. So that cell failed to respond to the 100 micromolar glutamate. So I haven't done any treatment on this. This is just a cell that happened to survive the injury rather than a cell that maybe would have died and then uh, I saved and went on. But the idea is after injury, do the cells respond the same way? And that might lead to the answer. The answer is no. And uh, some of them probably will. But anyway, um, so the, the next steps, this is only very preliminary, so I'm going to keep on doing that um, until I get a basic you know, work up. So what happens when the cells die and the cells will survive? And then I can start to ask, once I've characterized that, what happens if we treat them? And so the, one of the things I want to treat them with is the same potassium buffers. And if you remember back to that calcium diagram, the potassium buffers are tar targeting the, 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 where the injury is actually happening. It's preventing action potentials. Or I want to use a pharmaceutical. And we actually just submitted a grant two weeks ago to test a very specific pharmaceutical to reduce cell death following traumatic brain injury. Um, one that actually has to do with gene transcription and maybe genes that protect cells. So again, that pharmaceutical is going to be um, 
working downstream of the mitochondria bursting. It's going to be working downstream of some of the other proteins that are going to be transcri transcribed or not transcribed. And so I can actually compare how two different pharmaceuticals working at two different points in a cell death pathway um, affect these responses. Um, so, and then the question will become, can we reduce cell death? And if so, how do these cells respond to physiological uh, stimuli? Um, one of the questions, though, and, and I find this to be very true, is, there, is it possible I'm missing something here? Because the way neurons typically work is there's synapses and there's activation at specific synapses. That's what really makes the world go round. It's not just this overarching signal. And all this calcium is done with epifluorescence. And this is this kind of a similar image. These are astrocytes. She just changed the color um, so that it's a little bit more dramatic. Um, what's great about this epi is it's very fast. I actually run it every 20 seconds because I just don't care what's happening on a second by second. It's full field. We can get multiple cells in a field. It's really affordable and easy to use. You can train somebody who's never had any photonic experience on this in minutes. Um, this advantage, there's lower spatial resolution and there's no Z resolution. So I really can't pick apart astro the dendrites, axons. I just kind of see here is the cell that goes bright or it doesn't go bright. There's a lot of background and it's photo bleaching and phototoxic. So one thing to do would be to switch to confocal microscopy. And I, you guys probably know confocal pretty well, right? So you, you put the pinhole here, you put a pinhole here, and have your laser. And now you're basically getting rid of all of the light except the light from the plane you're imaging. So what this would do is it would uh, really increase, increase my spatial resolution, allow for this 3D overlay. The axons and the dendrites would come out. Um, the problem is it's really slow. It's a lot more costly. It's harder to train people up. When they break it, it's a real pain in the ass. Um, and this is even more photo bleach phototox than epifluorescence. So what I've been hoping to do for two years, but unable to accomplish for a very, very simple reason, and I'm trying to, I might get past this very soon, is to do a spinning disc just to see if there's anything we're missing. So the, you guys learned spinning disc yet? You basically have the disc that has multiple lenses. You spin it really fast. Um, if you go with a really small field, you can get up to 300 hertz, which is 10 times video rate, which is faster than we need to go. Um, again, this is you know really expensive and technical. Greg won't let me touch it without you know major hand holding. Um, the main reason we can't do this is remember we grow, grow these things on a, uh, a flexible membrane. It's opaque, and all the systems we have at CBST are inverted, so the light's coming from the bottom. So there's no way I can Im image through my opaque membranes. So there's a new company that's making optically clear membranes, and they sent me a bunch of samples to try, and all the samples were bad. So I'm trying to get new ones and get them on the spinning disk to see, is, is it possible we're missing something? I actually don't think so. I think the injury is so large that calcium is just filling these cells. I mean, that's patho pathological versus physiological. Um, so that's, that's one, one thing. Um, so are we losing these temporal and spatial data? Possibly. I don't think so, but I think it's important to look at. And again... The longitudinal studies, remember, part of my interest in this is not what happens to cells in 24 hours. We have a 12-year-old who's in a car accident. I want to know how he's going to be at 30 years old, right? And to, for that, we need longitudinal studies. Um, and this is more at a systems level. So one thing I actually did in my dissertation was some MRI studies. And what this is to illustrate is for the MRI studies, we actually perfused the brains. We had a we had one injury. So, oh, no, this would be without the MRI. This would just be if we did an anatomical study in, by perfusing, fixing rats, and staining the tissue. So if you have one injury severity and three different pharmaceuticals plus a control and five time points, it comes out to something like 240 animals. And, you, you know, you go through all these things, and I calculated that it would be 96 10-hour days just to kind of go through this, and if something didn't work, you'd have to do it all over again. And this actually kind of was my dissertation, and I would never do it again if I could avoid it. Um, I did a, a longitudinal study using MRI. So these are actually on fixed brains, which is why I have pretty good resolution. So what this is, is here's a naive animal here. This is a hippocampus in here. Here's your cortex, your corpus callosum, your thalamus is in here. And this white here is the um, cerebral spinal fluid. So you can see where it is. Now, when I have, this is a double injured animal. Look at this ventricle here and in here, totally blown out which means there's been a lot of atrophy, and even some in here. And um, 
I have another one where you can see the hippocampus is pretty well atrophied. So what's nice about this technique is you can actually, you don't have to perfuse. I could have imaged this animal over and over and over across time and seen this atrophy ha happening. So it's non-invasive, it's whole brain, it's white and gray matter, it's really slow. The spatial resolution sucks. MRIs are extremely expensive. Even the animal ones, I think the cheap ones are on the order of $800,000, and that's just to get the machine installed. That doesn't include the powering of the magnet and the staff you have to hire because you just can't have an MRI sitting around and people walk in and use it every day. Um, it takes up a lot of space. Those machines are huge. Like cars, huge. You know, cars, that it takes up a whole room. Um, so it, it's really not right for me. Um, what a lot of neuroscientists have been using now, and I, I looked at this at this, this year's neuroscience meeting. A couple of years ago, two photon microscopy, there was like five abstracts. <coughs> now we're up to hundreds of people using this technique. So you guys know two photon microscopy? Have you gone over it at all? So the, the basic idea here is you have an infrared laser, 700 to 1,000 nanometers, right, in a scanning mirror. So you split the, the beam. And so any one of these photons, this is the amount of energy, the excitation range of the floor four people are usually looking at are in the 300 to 500. So if any one photon hits the floor four, it won't excite. And so when you're down here where you're not in your sample, it doesn't excite. You need there to be uh, coincident photons entering that floor four at the same time. And so what this really does is it increases your resolution because there's only one spot or pretty much one spot that gets excited at any time. Um, and it also, because you're using these longer wavelengths, you have better penetration into tissue. So now you can actually do this on an intact animal. And this is actually one of my friends um, at UCLA. This is his study from his postdoc. And what he was looking at is synaptic formation in mice in the early days. He actually did a longer term study too. And so these are GFP transfected mice. And what he has here is this is postnatal day 16. So it's a 16-day-old 16, 16 mouse, and the same mouse at day 25. And what he points out here is you see this little bend right there? You can see this, the bend is right there. So he can go in even after all this development of synapses and, and all this sprouting, and he can still identify the same spot. And then what he did at this spot is he looked for these spine formations. And spines are where the synapses form. And so this is day 16, this is day 25. So he recorded this very same segment every day in vivo. So this is an intact animal. So it basically put optical glass right on top of the cortex, and they're just looking at the very top of the cortex. And these yellow dots here, if you notice, these six spines are here the entire time. Right? This blue dot here, this spine comes, it's gone. This blue dot here, here comes a spine, it's gone there. And then the red dot is a spine that forms here and becomes more permanent. He can see it every day. And so the idea now is with two photon microscopy, you have this increased resolution, you have this increased depth penetration, you have a model where you can keep the animal alive and ask the question, well, what happens to these synapses over time? So again, if I save a cell, what happens to that cell over a period of time? Most of what we're interested in is actually hippocampal in my lab. And one of the reasons that CBSC actually wanted me to come was to bring a technology over from Stanford um, called uh, microendoscopy, which is basically the same thing as that cortical window except in deep tissue. So what they did is they just basically took a, a gradient index lens, a piece of glass, and they put it down into the hippocampus with a little piece extending here from the top. And what they could do is when you focus the light on top of the grin, the gradient index, it would go down, excite, and the light would come back up, and you could actually record what was going on in the hippocampus. And they did both a HG arc lamp and they did a two photon. And um, what you can see here with the arc lamp, this is blood flow. And uh, they filled the, um, the tail with a fluorescent dye that wasn't picked up by the, the blood cells. So you can see these dark profiles going through there. Those are the blood cells. So there's your resolution. You can actually see blood flowing in the hippocampus. And they could record the same vessel day after day after day after day. And then what they would do, so you could measure blood flow here. And over here, when they did the two photon, you can actually measure the thickness of each one of these veins. So what they were doing at the time was a tumor study. And what tumors do is they recruit blood vessels, then the tissue dies and the blood vessels go away. So they could see the recruitment of blood vessels, they could see the size of the blood vessels grow and then shrink, and then the tissue die, and they could quantify that all. And for us, what we do is potentially look for synapses and hippocampal cells, and I think they're now doing calcium imaging. Um, so, again, you're co combining epi and two 
two photon imaging. Um, the epifluorescence is very fast. You could do blood flow. Two photon, um, and you could do calcium imaging. The two photon, you get this high resolution and depth penetration, and really you don't get a lot of photobleaching phototoxicity. And they've recorded from the same spot day after day after day, and the same neuron day after day after day. Um, the problem is it's really invasive. I wish I had a slot. I do actually have the pictures. They destroy a huge part of the cortex getting this thing down there. And so what, when you're doing an injury model, what part of your injury is from the injury you gave them and what part of the injury is just from putting this index lens in there? Um, so that's a big problem. Um, you have to introduce a marker to visualize points of interest. And a lot of the markers you'd introduce may or may not be toxic or they may or may not change the cells on their own. What type of marker? Like a calcium indicator. So the, the, the furidine actually has an a, it's AM esterified. So they put an esterase on either side of the dye. It'll just pass right through the membrane into a cell. And then the esterase is inside the cell. will cleave off the esters and the dye gets stuck in the cell. So a lot of people have started to do calcium imaging even. Um, a lot of the studies that they did actually had to do with mice that had um, you know, something behind a promoter. So you could actually have a calcium dye in theory produce something produced like a GFP by specific cells that they could look at. Um, the other problem with this is it's technically difficult and it's expensive. Buying a two-photon laser is just not cheap when you can buy an arc lamp bulb for a couple hundred dollars. Um, but those are all ways that we could really move from this really, you know, in vitro membranes, which a lot of my colleagues argue with me is totally meaningless. And I'm like, yeah, it's not physiological, but I can ask certain questions that you can't ask in vivo. Also, I can do it a lot quicker. And when you're growing cells, it's kind of like working with fruit flies. I can do hundreds of experiments when they can do tens. So if you're talking about high throughput, say you have ten drugs and you want to know which is the best drug, you can do a high throughput on your in vitro, kind of find the ones that the two work best, and then start to move them into the more complex, more expensive methods. So again, as a neuroscientist, I want a lot of things. I want speed, I want resolution, I want a large field of view with tissue penetration that I can do in vivo and in vitro. I don't want it to be inv invasive. I want good probes that are easy to use and I don't want them to be toxic and killing my cells or, or bleaching so that I can only do short things, um, which is all unrealistic. But, uh, you know, it's, a, it's what we're always moving towards. And remember that, that picture I showed from the top of Tahoe, me and my helmet, and my grad student in the helmet and the technician with no helmet? Well, that day Justin took a nasty fall. And he got carted off in an ambulance because he dislocated his shoulder. But he didn't have a concussion because he was wearing a helmet. So the moral of the story is accidents happen. And I, and I actually think one of the reasons we have such a hard time in trauma is that if you ask somebody why they don't wear a helmet, well, I'm not going very fast. You know, I'm a really good bike rider. My cousin is actually a really great bike rider. He rides the Ironman. He did the Ironman in Hawaii this year in under 10 hours. He was out training car cut him off, slammed into the car, got launched 30 feet, landed on his head in a snowbank. Helmet. No concussion. No helmet, probably would have died. Oh, my dad has a certificate. He's a bike rider. He has a certificate. Um, he says that, like, he's a Really? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, when I was, you guys know Marco Molinari, Molinaro? He's over at CBST. One of his students a couple years ago had to skip a semester of school or a couple quarters of school because she got hit by something. It wasn't her fault. She was riding her bike the way she was supposed to, but she got hit by somebody else. No helmet. And this happens all the time. And uh, it's just it's really not worth it. Really, really not worth it. But there is this perception that we can avoid head injury. I'm a good driver. I'm not going to get a car accident. I know how to ride a bike. I ride slowly. I'm always on the sidewalk. There's always excuses. Parkinson's disease, nobody makes excuses because it's out of your control. But people have this perception that they can con control trauma. And you really can't. So you want to start an campaign? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, we can't afford it. We it's actually... It's not even the amount, just like awareness. It's really, we've, we've had commercials that got shot and we couldn't afford to put them on TV. I mean, this is what I was saying. You have Michael J. Fox from Parkinson's. You have Christopher Reeves from spinal injury. You have this breast cancer awareness. We have nobody that's willing to get up there for head trauma. Also, head trauma is perceived negatively. Like, you're an idiot if you got one. You crashed your car. You crashed your bicycle, you know. It's, it's more taboo than, say having Parkinson's. And we have a hard time raising money. Um, and actually, if it weren't for this war, we'd still be having a really hard time raising money. But we're starting to get a little easier because the hedge funds have been all over the uh, news.
He was a sub in your student? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's not my student. He's a grad student in the lab. You don't usually see a lot of people on slopes with helmets. More and more. Really? More and more. I ski, and I've never, never, never seen a skier. I've seen more snowboarders, more. but... Yeah. I mean, last year I saw a lot of snowboards wearing. Last year I saw a few skiers wearing. Is he someone that does, like, jumps? Though? Nope. He, uh, he's actually not a very good snowboarder. He caught his edge. <laughs> and then he put his, his arm down and spun around his arm oh, and popped it out. But, um, you know, I hate wearing my bicycle helmet. It saved me, too. I actually, that's how I got my concussion. I was riding home from an Ultimate Frisbee game. No helmet, but a backpack full of my gym clothes and shoes and a bunch of other stuff. Um, there's a pothole, I turned, my foot came off the pedal and got stuck in the front spoke, stopped, you know, the bike just stops, endos, I got launched, um, my backpack comes over my head, I land head first in my backpack, black out for a couple seconds, bike was destroyed, we had to throw it out, bad contusions on my footwork, I caught in both my wrists because I landed like this, um, yeah, and I hate wearing it on my bike, but I do it every time. Um, on the on the slopes, it's actually great. I love my ski helmet. Yeah, I mean it's comfortable and it's warm. Like I really thought I'd hate it. I actually tried to climb into the car with it on once because I just didn't even realize I was wearing it. Not like your bike helmet, which is like a burden always. The ski helmet is great. I really, really like them. And you can now get the iPod ear flaps. So you can just I have a pocket in my jacket so that all those little cord comes out, plugs right in if you wanted to. Not that that's really safe, but, uh, and actually there was another patient we had at UCLA who took some like 80 foot dive off a cliff, bike riding, fell off a cliff, landed head first like this, and he survived. Not long term, he ended up dying, but, you know, no helmet, there's no, no head left, but he actually was alive for several days after that, because the helmet can absorb a huge amount of force. I actually wanted to do that calculation, what happens if you have 180 pounds fall 80 feet you know, because force equals mass times acceleration. You can figure out what the force is. And the fact that the helmet can absorb that kind of force is really incredible. So. Any that, questions right? in general? Yeah, I, I'm always a, a big... Uh, Good reminder. What was, what was great is at the summer meeting, and if they ever ask me to talk again, the number of people who were embarrassed to put up their hands when I asked, do you wear a helmet? Do you or not? Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs>